on when we meet together on Sunday mornings and Sunday evenings. We come together and what a glimpse of heaven we get, right? And the fact that we are not only going to be with each other someday, but those who have long passed, those who we miss, those who remain faithful unto death, we get to see them again too, amen? That's also the hope that we find in the book of 1 Thessalonians. But tonight, we're going to continue within this study. We're going to fi finish up this study, wrapping up the Godhead. We went through uh, everything dealing with the eternity. I say everything. We scratched the surface. That's what we did. Because honestly, this particular topic that we've been going through for the last several weeks, uh, it is so, uh, like I had said, uh, like I've been saying all throughout the study, 2,000 years. Uh, and even, even going back to the earliest writings like Moses, man has been talking and praising about God, going back to the beginning. And yet all those years combined of glorifying and praising Him come nothing close. Excuse me, don't even come close to how amazing He truly is, amen? How beautiful He really is. How glorious and amazing He really is. But tonight we're going to wrap up our study in this particular topic, dealing with God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, dealing with how they each, uh, how each of those personalities function and make one God, and the beauty that there is, the cohesiveness that we see, and the love that God has for us. So tonight what we're going to see is how that, uh, God, excuse me, how that love was demonstrated by God to all of humanity. If you have your Bibles, I want us to go ahead and look at Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to go ahead and begin reading in Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to go ahead and begin looking at the work of the Father in redemption. Paul writing this book. If you could recall, several months back, about a year ago, we went through the book of Ephesians in the adult class, right? We broke it down. The book of Ephesians could be summarized in the theme of the, of the Church of Christ. In other words, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. Think of all those different names, those descriptions of the church that we find. The majority of them are found in Ephesians, the army of God, right? We see that as soldiers of Christ, the bride of Christ, the glory of Christ, the church of Christ. As we look through the book of Ephesians, Paul wants them, before going into any further, this particular verse that we're going to be looking at tonight, Paul says, before I can tell you how to conduct yourselves as the church, let me show you how amazing God is, who without God there would be no church. Without his love, without his providence, without his care, without his mercy, without his kindness, that God, as Paul describes in Ephesians chapter 2, that God who is rich in mercy, without that, where would we be? I love the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians. Paul gives this exuberant praise of how he's like, I got some things I want to tell you about, but let's praise on God. Let's do that. Paul says, I got some amazing things that I want to share with you. I've got some things I want you to live by that God inspiring me wants you to live by. But first and foremost, let's praise God and let's glorify God because the things that I'm writing to you would not be possible hadn't it been for what he done. Hadn't it been for his love before the foundation of the world. We're going to begin seeing as we look at this verse, at this section of scripture, how Paul begins showing the work of God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in redemption. Let's go ahead and pick up in verse 3, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3, as we look at the work of the Father in redemption. And this is what Paul writes. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this particular word, blessed, uh, this is exuberant praise. This is very common in Hebrew to use words like baruch and, and things like that. Words of that case to describe how amazing God is. It's exuberant praise. We bless Him because He blesses us. You ever stop to think about that? You think about whenever we, whenever we say a prayer before the food, right? Oftentimes we think that whenever we're asking God, you know, we, whenever we go to God in prayer, we're saying, Lord, bless this meal. That's part of it, but you realize we're also blessing Him, right? We're saying, thank you, God. We're giving Him glorification for the things that He's given us. So that's how Paul starts us off, saying, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That phrase, Lord, implies that He is King of kings and Lord of lords. The fact that He was and is and, in fact, always will be deity. And the fact that He calls Him the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the name Jesus comes from the word Yeshua, right? Salvation. He is salvation. And what does Christ come from? That's the Greek word for Messiah, the anointed one. That he is, in fact, the one who would come to redeem humanity. This is exuberant praise. And he turns his attention now at this point to the Father. 
And as we say, he, as we look, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every, this is all, all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. James chapter 1 and verse 17, James himself even says that every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no shadow or variation of change. That everything that is important, everything that is, because at the end of this life, what is the thing that is going to be the most important? Our spiritual state. And he has provided us everything that we need. Those spiritual blessings not only range from salvation, but also the strength that he gives us, the encouragement that he gives us, the faith that we have. All those blessings that encompass living in the spirit. Thanks be to God the Father. Amen. Saying he's given us every, he hasn't left out some he hasn't said, oh, no, you know, I don't want, you know, there's some that you don't need right now. No, he's given us every spiritual blessing. You and I have access to those things because of God the Father. We look at this. We continue on. And he says, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, this idea of the heavenly places is a spiritual world to which we have access through Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, I want us to look at what Paul has to say in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 through 21 about this. Philippians chapter 3, we're going to go ahead and look at verse 20 through 21. And Paul reminds the church at Philippi, Paul sitting in prison, and the thing that he reminisces the most about, or the thing that he longs for, he doesn't not only reminisces about them, but he longs for his home with them. And he wants them to remember this. He says, but our citizenship is where? It's in heaven, in the heavenly places. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. You see, you and I, we have a home in heaven someday, and that's a part of those spiritual blessings. And God being in heaven where God dwells, everything encompassing the universe, He's given us everything we need so we can make it to that home someday. That's why Paul, or excuse me, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, he's given unto us all things pertaining to life and godliness. Praise God, amen. This is what Paul is doing in this, as we look at this prologue to the book. He says this, verse 4, even as he chose us, now we're going to go ahead and look at this. Who is this us he's talking about? He's talking about the church. Remember, this book details the church. He's saying he's chosen us, that is the church in him, before the foundation of the world. You know what he wants us to know? That the, that the church was not some sort of afterthought to the Father. That man messed up and God was just like, oh man, well, I kind of kind of messed that one up, didn't they? So what do we do now? No, it was foreordained before the foundation of the world. This was God's plan from the beginning, before the beginning. He's saying, before the words were even uttered, let there be light. God had a plan for humanity. God had a plan to redeem man from sin. God had a plan to send his son to die on the cross for you and for me. Again, this isn't some afterthought. This isn't some, all right, well, let's move on to plan B. No, this has always been a part of God's plan. And it has always been a part of God's plan to bring you to be a part of his family. As we continue to look at this, he says, even as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be, again, this was part of his plan, that we should be holy. This word holy means set apart for a purpose, right? Sanctified, just like the way he is holy. That we should be holy and blameless. This idea of blameless means clean before him. That was always God's intention. Even with Adam and Eve, his intention for them was to dwell with him in holiness and love, Right? You think about the way the world was before uh, Genesis chapter 3. You got Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2. The world has peace. There's unity, right? God and man are on good terms. There's no animosity. There's no chaos. There's just this family. Because before there was Jew, before there was Gentile, before there was different languages, there was God and man. And that's the way God had always purposed it. Before the foundation of the world, he purposed for him and his creation to dwell together in unity but you jump to Genesis chapter 3 and what happened to man? Man messed up, right? Man gave that up. Allowed for pride and sin to enter into the world. And that's what separated us from God. But God, before the foundation of the world, that's the reason why when, when he's turning and, and dealing with the serpent as well as Adam and Eve, you remember in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, uh, this isn't some off-the-cuff plan that he had. He tells him, he says, this is something that's going to take place. And you remember what he said? 
he said that there would come one who would bruise the head of that serpent. And that was God's plan from the beginning and before the beginning. That there would come one, and not only him, but also a plan. You'll read it all throughout the prophecies of the minor prophets. You don't just read about the coming of the Christ, but you also read about the coming of the church, right? Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44, that there shall be an everlasting kingdom that shall never be shaken, that will outlive all other kingdoms because it is the kingdom of God. The kingdom, the church. That was planned. That's why when he says he's chosen us, he's not talking like, you know, some people teach from this passage, you know, he's handpicked people that he wants and, he, and the other people he doesn't want. No, that's not what it's saying here. It's saying he's handpicked us as a church. That the church, just like the way at one point Israel was going to be that family that would help the world, like Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6 says, that would help the world see the glory of God, you and I as the church, the kingdom of God, the church that's been around for 2,000 years, the church that not is confined, excuse me, that's not just confined to this building, but reaches the borders of the earth. The church is to be that beacon of light to help all of humanity. And God planned that before the foundation of the world. We keep looking at what he says. He says that we, verse 4, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us, again, the church, for, notice this word, adoption. See, this adoption, this word right here is this bestowment of a familial relationship where at one point there was nothing but animosity. This adoption, uh, this word here in the Greek is used in reference to say, you weren't at one point family, but now you are. Now you are called sons and daughters of God because of what Jesus did, because of the Father, specifically in this context, what the Father did, sending His only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins. That word adoption is so significant. You think about, you know, a couple weeks back when we talked about the Father, you remember we used, we used the sermon, or excuse me, the parable of the prodigal son. And you remember how the prodigal son, the word prodigal means he lived wastefully, he lived wastefully, and he blew his inheritance. He went off and lived. Everything that he did, uh, according to the culture of the Middle East, especially in Semitic cultures, he should have been cut off and not considered a son any longer. As a matter of fact, his very statement, uh, saying, give me my inheritance, is almost like saying, I want you dead. I don't want to be your son anymore. I want to be on my own. Because typically you didn't get your inheritance until after your father had passed. Uh, that was the custom. And to want it now, to demand it now, meant it's not, I, I, I would much rather, man, if things could speed up and you could be gone, that'd be great. That was the way the son was to his father. And yet, you remember when the son came back, how did his father welcome him back? As a son. As his child. The father represents God in that passage. And you and I, who at one point, Paul's going to go in detail to the church at Ephesus, those who were alienated, darkened in their minds, and so on and so forth. He says he's brought near because of Jesus Christ. You and I are adopted as his children. That word adoption means you and I have all of the blessings of what it means to be a child of God. There's not things left out. There's not things that are, well, you know, you are. Because Paul includes, the, 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 uh, Paul's, not just, Paul's not just speaking about himself and his fellow Jewish brethren. This whole book also helps us better understand that Paul is also dealing with not only the Jews, but as well as the Gentiles. And now God has brought together these two groups of people that otherwise culture has separated and made them one family, and they both share in that blessed inheritance of the Father together. The fact that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You and I have that blessing. We have that blessing. We have that beautiful title of being called a child of God because he adopted us and said, I want you. That's amazing, right? He said, I want you. He, point, he says that to every single person that is on the face of the earth, but every single person's got to come to him, right? They've got to obey him. And those who did obey him, again, like what John said in his prologue in John chapter 1, to those who received him, he gave the right to be called children of God, who were born not of the will of the flesh, but the will of God. That's what Paul brings out in this next section. He says, as sons through Jesus Christ, according to whose will? Was this something that I asked of God? Was it something that said, God, I demand that you make me your son? No. He had a plan to make us his children, to make the church his children, his family, his sons and daughters, long before the foundation of the world. There was nothing I can do to force God's hand to be adopted. He didn't consult me at anything. 
He had planned it long before the foundation of the world according to his will. In other words, that was always his desire to love on his creation. Isn't that amazing? We keep looking as we see what he says here, that he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. Again, remember, we were one time strangers to him, but now we are his children. And why? Because of Jesus. We're going to get to that a little bit later, but since it's here, uh, John chapter 14 and verse 6, what does Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Paul would remind the Galatians of that. He would remind them the same thing, that we are called, and he's talking, about, he's talking to the Galatians, that we as both Jew and Gentile are all called sons of God if we obey him and we follow his plan. We keep reading verse 6. He says, To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in, beloved, in the beloved. The beloved. That's Jesus. You remember Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5, uh, Jesus, or rather the Father would speak. You remember Jesus and his disciples are there, at what's called the Mount of Transfiguration. They see Moses, they see Elisha there in Matthew chapter 17. See Moses, they see Elisha, and they see him, they see them conversing with Jesus, right? And they're amazed. And Peter is amazed. He says, let's build tabernacles here. Let's, let's celebrate what's going on here. And then suddenly these two individuals that are opposite Jesus fade away. And then a voice from heaven breaks out, right? Clouds, a voice from the clouds of heaven spoke, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. This beloved that he's referencing here is Jesus Christ. And that's where he's going to transition into the next aspect of the sermon as we look at the next aspect of this prologue. See, we see the work of the Father in verse 3 through 6. We are blessed by him. We are chosen by him. We are predestined by him. We are adopted by him. We are accepted by him. The fact that he calls us his sons and daughters, those who don't deserve it, right? We're blessed because of that. But now we turn to how the son works in redemption. Let's go ahead and begin reading in verse 7. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, this is what Paul says. He says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, or according, excuse me, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of this grace. In who? In that beloved, in him, that's a Jesus Christ, we have redemption. What does this word redemption mean? What does that word mean, redemption? It means that a price has been paid. You get this imagery of those who have been delivered. Uh, one of the greatest examples of that in the Old Testament is the children of Israel in Egypt, right? They're in bondage. They're in slavery. 400 years there's no hope for them except for in God Almighty. And God mightily delivers them out of Egypt and makes them his people, a covenant people. And God does the same thing and even more so with those in the world who choose to follow him. If you're in Christ, you are the redeemed. A price has been paid. He's paid your debt. But how does he say he's paid our debt? He says we have been redeemed through his blood. Through his blood, through his atoning sacrifice. You know, Paul in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 would say that we are purchased, the church was purchased by his blood, that Jesus had to shed blood. You know, there are some, they're not translations of the Bible, they're paraphrases. In other words, uh, there, there's, there's no credible sources to them other than the fact that they are writing what the opinions of man say. There are some paraphrases that call themselves Bibles that omit the phrase blood and things like that. You want to know why? Because people are squeamish by the very thought of blood. And yet Jesus had to bleed. He had to suffer. He had to go through torment. Because that is what you and I were worthy of. What, what, is, what does Paul write to the Romans? For the wages of sin is what? Is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. He paid that price that you and I could never pay. We owed this debt that was so insurmountable that we can't even begin to think and comprehend how could I ever pay this back. It's kind of like, you remember the unmerciful servant. The debt that he owed was more than anyone could ever pay in a lifetime. Don't care if you're the richest, if you have a, take a group of the richest people in the world combined, they couldn't even pay off the debt that that man owed. And he was forgiven. That's what God does with us. Uh, but notice this redemption. He not only pays the debt through his blood, but then that goes to that other phrase. He says, through, what does he say? The forgiveness. He says, through his blood, we have forgiveness of our trespasses. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. 
That word forgiveness, it shows even more this idea of redemption that's amazing. Because here's the redemption is pulling us up out of the mire. Forgiveness is cleaning us off. It's cleaning that muck off. It's cleaning that gross, permeating sin out of our lives. He's forgiven us. See, when God freed Israel from Egypt, He didn't free them from Egyptian bondage so they continued to live in Egyptian bondage, right? He made them free from that. He broke the power of Egypt off of them. He took those shackles off of them, and that's what God does with sin because of Jesus Christ. In the Son, we have redemption. We have forgiveness. It doesn't matter what sin you have committed in your lifetime. If you are repentant and you're willing to obey God, He forgives you. And there is nothing greater than that. Amen? There is nothing greater than forgiveness. Than God's love. God demonstrated His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. We have that blessing because of Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, that would not be the case. Without Jesus coming to earth and dying on the cross, without him shedding blood, without him suffering and dying and rising in power and glory in his resurrection. Paul would say in, to, the, to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we would be miserable, right? There would be no hope. But that's why he concludes that section there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the what? The victory. Let me tell you, if you're a member of the church, if you're a Christian, you are victorious because God gave it to you through Jesus Christ. You have overcome John with the scribe and say that we are more than conquerors. Amen? Amen. That's what we are. We are more than conquerors because of him who's conquered all things. Because of Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and keep looking at this passage, if you will. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins, and he says this, according to the riches of his grace. That idea of according to his riches, uh, the riches of his grace. That word riches. Uh, it's almost uh, like oversized grace. That's what it's talking about there. That word oversized. Think like supersized. You remember back in the day, you go to McDonald's, you ask for like a supersized drink. I don't know how many of you guys ever took advantage of that while there, because you can't anymore. It's a shame. Some countries you still can, but not anymore. Anyway, um, you know, it's almost like a bucket of like, uh, of, of Dr. Pepper if you want, and you got like this huge like bucket of fries and all that stuff. Literally kids, it was like buckets. No, I'm joking, it wasn't. Uh, but it, they were huge. They were massive amounts. And you think, like, how could anybody possibly get through all that? And that's what God's grace is like. Except it's actually healthy for us. It's beneficial for our spiritual well-being. The fact that God's grace keeps abounding and abounding and abounding and abounding. And the fact that God's grace is so beautiful and glorious. The fact that His grace is amazing and that He is rich in it. That's why uh, Paul would say later to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, But God being rich in mercy. You know what that means? God doesn't go broke with mercy. He doesn't say, mm, pockets are empty. Ain't got no more, sorry. But Paul would say, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Grace is amazing, but we don't take advantage of that grace, amen? But Paul reminds these Christians here, he reminds them, man, God's grace and mercy is so rich. It is beautiful. And the fact that because of his son, we have that. Because no one can come to the Father without the son, and no one can receive that inheritance without the son, and no one can receive that grace without the son. Thank you, Lord for what you've done and what you've accomplished in our lives. We keep reading. As we look at verse 8, this is what he says. He says, he says which he lavished upon us. You remember how uh, we talked about the, the, uh, the story of the prodigal son, the father, man. The father welcomes him back and he lavishes his love on him, right? It means the fact that you and I are robed and robed and robed in this grace and mercy. The fact that he, this, this being, this immense being who is rich in these things, the fact that he pours it out on us, he pours, up, he pours it in our cup and it keeps flowing and flowing and flowing and it doesn't run out. That's what this idea of lavish is. He keeps on giving you his grace and he loves you and his grace is rich. Of course, in accordance with our obedience to him. Uh, that's why Paul would say to the church at Galatia, uh, you've fallen from grace. God wants to give you something amazing. And he tells them there, he says, how could you continue to live the way you live, taking advantage of God's grace? God's grace is rich, but you're taking advantage of it. 
the fact that God has lavished us in grace is not something to take lightly. That's why Paul, Paul's writing this, because you got to think about where Paul was before all this. If there's anyone who could understand God's grace and mercy and truly love it and adore it and appreciate it, somebody like Paul, right? All of us, if we open up our eyes wide enough when we look in our lives, we recognize, because there are plenty of people who think, well, you know, I wasn't as bad as Paul. Let me tell you, yeah, he may have been killing Christians, but whatever we were doing prior to Christ, we were just as worse off as him. We realize that, right? That there is no, there is no, well, you know, you weren't as bad as this person, so I'm going to let you slide. No, we were outside of Christ just like the way Paul was, and yet he had this immense appreciation for what God has done, and that's why he's trying to remind uh, these, these people at Ephesus that God the Father has done this through the Son. Let's love this. Let's, let's praise God for this. Let us live in exuberant praise because of that. Keep reading. And this is what Paul says. He says, He lavished us upon, excuse me, He lavished uh, the grace upon us in all wisdom and insight. This word wisdom is supreme intelligence. Making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have attained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. I want us to go ahead and backtrack for a second in verse 9. Make known to us the mystery. What is the mystery, Paul? What are you talking about here? What mystery did we not understand? Because the church, I mean, that was something that was prophesied of. Uh, but what's the confusion here? What was something that at one point we did not know? And it wasn't because God was, was, was you know, only a select few, secret few. No, no, that was the teaching of, of the Gnostics and other people in their day. That wasn't the teaching of the New Testament. But the fact that this mystery that was made revealed because of what Jesus did. The fact that this mystery, that because of Jesus, all men everywhere, not just Jew, but including Gentile, can be called the family of God. Uh, when he says right here in verse 9, the mystery, you jump to verse 10. He says, as a plan for the fullness of time to do what? To unite all things in him. You realize that God, long before the foundation of the world, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 18, tells us that he's been about the ministry of reconciliation bringing man back to him and reuniting man back together. Because just as we said earlier, before there was ever Jew or Gentile, there was man. And God, being rich in his mercy, has demonstrated his love, not just to the Jew, but as Paul says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, what does he say there? He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone who believes, the entire world who follows him, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He says, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. See, the work of Christ on the cross is the central axis of human history. You realize that, right? That's the hub of everything. That was the most significant, if you ever, ever pondered, what was the most significant event in history? It was the coming of Jesus Christ. Oh, think about it. The world was never the same again. The fact that when man fell, you go from Genesis chapter 3 all the way up to the New Testament, and what do you have? You have man floundering in sin. A God who is rich in mercy, a God who is loving, but man who struggles so deeply with sin, and there's nothing that man can do to lift that burden off of them until the Messiah came. And the world was never the same again. Until he came, he lived, he died, he was buried, and he resurrected the world was never the same again. Oh, praise God for that. Thanks be to God who gives us that victory, just like we mentioned earlier. And because of Him, we have hope. We have salvation. And the fact that this isn't just for a select few people, but everyone can be called a child of God. Everyone can be a part of that family, no matter your language, no matter your background, no matter what part of the world you live in, no matter your culture, no matter you are Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, free, but all are made one in Christ Jesus. Amen? It's a family that is open to everyone. And you've heard me say this before, God wants you. He wants you so bad. God loves you but he wants to do something better in your life. Amen? And God wants all people to follow him. But all people must come to repentance. 
That's what Paul would say in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. That at this time of ignorance, God winked up and now he commands all men everywhere to repent. But Peter himself would say in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, he would remind us that the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come. Remember that word all, everyone, should come to repentance. That is the love of the Father and the Son. We keep reading as we look together. It says, in him, verse 11, let's go ahead and look at that. In him we have, as your Christians, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, now he's, he's starting to shift a little bit here. He's saying so that we, and if you look at the, the rest of the context of this book, he's going to show so that we, uh, the Jews, that's who he's speaking of, because he says right here that we who were the first to hope in Christ, see the, the gospel came to the Jews first, right? Because they had the prophets. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 through 2 reminds us of that. As a matter of fact, Paul in Romans chapter 3 and verse 2 says that they were given the oracles of God. In other words, they were given the prophets. They were given the word so that the gospel could be received by them first. Where did Peter preach on the day of Pentecost? In Athens? He preached in Jerusalem. The people who were near to understanding. The people who their entire culture Everything from the sacrifices they made to the feast days that they had, all centered on one thing, and that is God's redemption to humanity. It came to them first. But Paul would continue on as we look at this. He says, So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Before we move on, we see that the work of the Son, because of him, we are redeemed through his blood. We are put together because of him. We have an inheritance because of him. But now we look at what Paul describes as the work of the Holy Spirit in redemption. The work of the Holy Spirit in redemption. As we look at these final two verses. It says, In him you, now he turns this in verse 13 to the Gentiles. Because that's the church at Ephesus. They were made up of Gentiles says, and to you also, when you heard the word of truth, what is the word of truth? Uh, John chapter 8, and verse 24, you remember Jesus himself prayed. Uh, he, 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 said, he said, what did he tell them? That you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? The truth shall set you free. John chapter 17, and verse 17, as Jesus prayed to his father, he said to him, sanctify them in truth, set them apart with the truth. Your word is truth. What does Paul say is the truth here? He says this, he says, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. What's the gospel? The good news. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's how Paul defines it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1 through 4. This is the gospel which you received, that Jesus Christ died according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he resurrected according to the scriptures. That's the saving message of humanity, the gospel he says, in him also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed, this idea of belief implies obedience, that you believed enough to say, I want to follow you, and I want to do whatever it takes to follow you, were sealed. Now, this word sealed right here is like that of a seal or a signet. Like when people years ago, they had signet rings, kings and whatnot, they had signet rings, they would stamp their signet ring on, on, a, on a document or, or on some sort of parchment to signify, or even items sometimes to signify ownership, to signify that this is mine or these are my words and so on and so forth. See, the Holy Spirit in your life acts like that. It says that you're His. Remember in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Verse 37, they said, what should we do? After he preached to them the gospel message, he said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall what? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, he says the same thing again, reminding them of the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives as that symbol of who we are, that we belong to God. The fact that we have the Spirit in our lives says that we are truly children of God and are no longer the world's. As a matter of fact, in verse 14, this is what he would say. He says, who is the guarantee? Some translations may say something different, but this idea of guarantee in the word, it was actually the Greek word that was used for engagement ring. Uh, you ever think about that? The fact that the Holy Spirit in your life is like an engagement ring from God. Now, and later on, we're going to be called the bride of Christ, right? The church. It's an engagement ring from God saying that I promise to fulfill everything that I have planned for you in your life. But it also says that you and I must continue to do our end to continue that engagement, right? We've got to be faithful. We've got to stay true to Him. 
we can't commit infidelity. Because he's given us this promise saying, you are mine. With Israel, uh, back in the Old Testament, to fulfill the Old Covenant, Israel was oftentimes called the bride of God. It was oftentimes described as being God's bride. And when they committed adultery, he correlated it as that. So you guys commit spiritual ad adultery. He said, running, when you go to the world, it's like you are cheating on the one who loves you. When you and I, because we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, that not only that mark of ownership, but as well as that symbol that you and I are God's. And we are betrothed to Him. And He is, in fact, the one who loves us. And we belong to no other. For us to go against that, that's faithlessness, isn't it? That's adultery. See, when we look at what He talks about here, he says, the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. This inheritance that he's talking about, what's he talking about there? He's going to go into more detail in the rest of this book as to what that inheritance is. The inheritance being that glory land, heaven, until we acquire it. When are we going to acquire that? When the Lord returns. He says, to the praise of his glory. I like how he concludes that. He concludes it again with praise. Because let me tell you, God is amazing and worthy of all praise. Amen? God is. And when you look at how God the Father has worked within our lives to achieve redemption, we are blessed by Him. We are chosen by Him. We are predestined by Him. We are adopted by Him to be called His sons and daughters. We are accepted by Him. The work of the Son, we are redeemed through His blood. We are put together because of Him. We have an inheritance because of Him. And the work of the Holy Spirit, He seals and marks us, and He is our guarantee. You know what that all says? Oh, what we can summarize? That God truly loves us. And that this same thing in which we just read that you and I have, we want the rest of the world to have the same thing. Amen? This isn't just something that we want to harbor for ourselves. This is something we want to share with all of humanity. This is something that we need to share with all of humanity because God's extension of His love, His grace, His mercy is not just to a certain group of people, but to everyone who chooses to follow Him. To everyone who desires to call Him Father to call him Lord, to call him King. See, Paul, writing to this congregation at Ephesus, he's reminding them of these things because at times we forget. And the reason why we did this whole study on who God is is because we can go around saying God loves you. We can go around saying God bless you. We can go around doing that. But do we truly understand who that God is that we're talking about? Because, man, when Paul talks about God, uh, you can read it within his writing. When he talks about God, he falls on his knees in submission and in praise. Do I do the same thing? Do I do the same thing when we sing songs of praise to our Lord and Savior? Do I do the exact same thing? Do I have that same contrite heart that says, how could this amazing God love me so much? How could this amazing God be so powerful and immense and beyond my comprehension and this being who's created all things, this being who is absolutely vast, this being who I can't compare anything with, loves me. Loves, and I know we don't like to think because our society teaches us to think bigger about ourselves and what we really are, but in the grand scheme of things, in comparison to God, you and I are extremely insignificant. And that's not a bad thing because he still loves us. And that's the greatest fact that man can ever know. Amen? That God can love us despite who we are. And he's extended that love and mercy to everyone who wants to follow after him. And if we lose sight of that, if we think because I came up out of that water, I don't need to think about these things anymore. This is all elementary stuff, Paul. This is all basic stuff. God, the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. That's all elementary. Absolutely not. Because Paul relished in talking about it. Paul loved talking about it. Uh, let me tell you something. Paul didn't just write good theology about it. He lived that kind of lifestyle. These are letters written from prison. Uh, the one that we just read from, the book of Ephesians tonight, that was written in prison, and Paul's still writing this deep praise in the midst of immense suffering. This was a man who absolutely glorified God. So I have to look at my life and ask myself, do I praise like the way Paul did? And Paul, you know what Paul would even write? He, he would write to his brethren multiple times, like the Thessalonians, glorify him even more. Let your love exceed, outdo one another in this. Because man, we've got a lot to be thankful for, amen? We've got a lot to glorify him for. That's why we did this study. 
Paul, we already know God. God, Jesus, those are the right answers in every Bible class. Amen, right? Yeah, no, no, this is deeper than that. Because God is so much more vast than just a surface level understanding of God. I can tell you, if we're going to draw closer in a relationship with God, we need to learn Him better. You think if we knew God better, our relationship with Him would be deeper? The way we treat people would be so much more meaningful. If we dove into a deeper relationship with God, and that's the purpose of this whole study, don't settle for a surface relationship with God. Stop settling for the bare minimum with Him. Because He has not done that with you from the beginning, right? He's never done that. He gave of himself so that, he gave entirely of himself so that you and I can have hope. So why would I then, the other partner in that relationship, why would I settle for less when I can love him more and deeper? The blessing is, is that this same God, I can tell you there are so many things that we talked about in these last several weeks that my mind doesn't always wrap around, that I still have to study myself uh, continually that I still have to dive deeper in because there are some things that, that I'm just like, man, that I, I know that, but how, how could that possibly be? That's so amazing. There's going to come a day, we're not going to be wondering that anymore. We're just going to be glorifying him and praising him and it's all going to come and make sense. Or God is just going to tell us, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord because that's life's mission to get to know him better. You remember how a few week, uh, last week I made a mention in my morning sermon how we've been designed with a purpose and to go against that purpose. It's a lot like when a phone, a computer, doesn't do the functions that it's supposed to do. It goes against what it was designed to do, right? When humanity doesn't seek out God, we're going against our design. We were designed for so much more. We were designed for something greater. And to go against that how can we expect what real meaning in life is? How can we expect real happiness? How can we expect real fulfillment in anything if we go against the very thing we were created for? And that's to draw closer to God and to fall in love with Him as He has always loved us. Remember what we talked about earlier this morning in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 19. We love because He first loved. If you're here this evening, and you feel like you need to dive deeper into that relationship, please don't leave here tonight and say, all right, we're moving on to the next sermon series. No, meditate on these things. Don't leave here tonight if your relationship with God has been lackluster. We encourage you to come forward and to make and renew that relationship with him and make it stronger because he's given you a family to help you do that as well. He's given you children, uh, fellow children of God to help you do that. We encourage you to come forward to rekindle that love with God once more so that you too can hear, well done, good and faithful servant. If there's anything that we can do for you this evening, we encourage you to come forward as together we stand and as we sing.